Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on, on where you are. My name is Marco Mingini. Uh, I will be the chair of uh, the next talk of the academic track. And I'm happy to introduce the next uh, speaker, Natalia Morandeira, who is a doctor in biological sciences. Uh, she's a researcher at the National Scientific and Technical Research Council, working at the Institute of Research and Environmental Engineering of the University of San Martin. Her research focuses on landscape ecology and wetland plant ecology, aided by remote sensing and geographic information systems tools. And today she's presenting a, a talk uh, titled Monitoring Active Fires in the Lower Paraná River Floodplain, Analysis and Reproducible Reports on Satellite Thermal Hotspots. Natalia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marco, for introducing me, and thank you all for coming to my talk. Uh, here Today I'm sharing some of my work during uh, last year, and my slides are available. I'm sharing the link uh, through the chat. So first I want to give some uh, background on the environmental topic. Floodplains. Uh, Wetlands cover more than 20% of South America, of the continent, and among these uh, wetlands, um, uh, large areas are covered by floodplain wetlands, such as uh, those associated to the Amazonas, the Orinoco, and the Paraná River. The dynamics of these large floodplains wetlands depend on flood pulses and climatic conditions. In this uh, picture, I'm showing an aerial view of the Paraná River floodplain uh, in a high water level condition in the year 2010. And you can see that freshwater marshes are uh, very green and uh, there are a lot of uh, shallow lakes with uh, open water. However, last year and this year too, the area, the, the, the Paraná River is extremely low and the, the floodplain is um, very dry. So in this uh, aerial view of the Paraná River floodplain in Argentina, in, uh, this is a picture that was taken last year, you can see that the freshwater marshes are very dry. There was a lot of dry uh, biomass and uh, here are some uh, native forests and water uh, is reduced to permanent shallow lakes, open water. So in this context, um, el, in this context, uh, the area was affected by extended fires and at least uh, 329,000 hectares were uh, burned. Uh, this area corresponds to 14% of the Paraná River Delta and uh, about half of the area belongs to natural protected areas. So, uh, last year I aimed to monitor the wildfires using spatial data. In particular, I used satellite thermal hotspots. So now I'm uh, sharing some physical uh, background on this uh, spatial data. The energy emitted by the Earth in the thermal infrared wavelengths can be related to surface tem temperature. So with, uh, uh, we can measure this uh, emitted energy with remote sensing. Sensors on board of satellites can measure the thermal infrared emissivity. And uh, thermal hotspots are very hot pixels that are probably related to active fires. The NASA um, publishes fire hotspot products uh, within three hours of the um, acquisition of the satellite prod or the satellite imageries, and these data are freely accessible so through the fire information for resource management system. The data can be downloaded as point vector layers, and you can also visualize it online uh, like this uh, red hotspot. So uh, these products are generated um, from two different from different uh, sensors. 
which differ in their sensor resolution. Uh, sensor resolution needs to be taken into account when interpreting the, the when interpreting the results. So uh, if we if we imagine um, if we imagine um, a fire like the one that is shown in this picture, if this fire is monitored with a low resolution sensor uh, system, probably few hotspots are detected, each one corresponding to a large hot area. While if the same uh, fire is monitored with a medium resolution sensor, you pro we probably will detect more hotspots, each one corresponding to a smaller hot area. So this needs to, to be taken into account when uh, interpreting results and comparing uh, fire activities throughout the years. So my aim uh, during last year was to uh, process these uh, point vector layers uh, and I constructed the workflow that I'm presenting here to reproduce the same analysis and automatize most of the steps and to generate bilingual reports. The aim was to uh, do quick analysis and summarize the information of the, the on-fire situation, mainly because uh, peers and journalists asked I were asking us for updated information and also uh, the lockdown and the fires prevented us from conducting field work. So we had to, we need to work with the satellite information and also we have our background in the study area because in our uh, lab we have been conducting studies in the Paraná River Delta for almost 20 years. So that was the general situation and the it, it seemed fine but the problem was that we needed to repeat the same analysis once and again to uh, write dissemination articles um, here is a, a talk at our at our university by patricia candus uh, post in social uh, media uh, write dissemination articles respond to journalists and that's why uh, i i need to out, uh, repeat, uh, produce a reproducible workflow. In the first, um, the first months in June, uh, I designed a Cauchy's modeler uh, to process the, the special data. So in this modeler, uh, the input layers are the uh, hotspot product from Beer satellite and Modi satellite, the, uh, you download uh, four um, layers. One is the Beer's uh, current data, Beer's archive data, Modi's current data, Modi's archive data, and with the modeler, you can uh, I, I merge the data, clip the data to the study area, reproject them, reproject them, and um, export a uh, output layer with uh, all the active fire records in a single uh, shape file. This is how the modeler is seen from the, the view of an end user. And uh, one problem was that uh, I found a source of, uh, of error that was manual layer selection. You can note here, I, you have to upload, select each of the, of the layers. And um, for example, in this screenshot, I um, mis-selected the, the same layer twice. So this is a source of error. And also it is time demanding and zipping the shape files, selecting the layers, and then the, um, the layer needs to be further analyze and export it to R to construct the plots and summarize the information. Cushis um, has an advantage that is uh, that it can generate very nice uh, maps. And for example, uh, I generated this uh, animation. This is an example of an animation included in a dissemination article co-authored with Patricia Candus and Priscilla Minotti. 
and uh, this animation was generated with the plugin Time Manager uh, that uh, recently was replaced by an integrated temporal control function, function and is included in Cushis. So next, I um, I wrote a call in, in R to account for all these steps and to produce the reports and, and the plots and the reports. And first I show what you need uh, if you want to use the script as an end user. You only need to uh, have a polygon layer of your study area and save that um, polygon layer in a specific folder. Next, you go to the firm's NASA uh, web page and download the, the archive data. And here you can download the, it, the data with a, a very broad bounding box, just drawing a, a polygon. And then you zip the you you save the zipped uh, files to uh, in a specific folder in your R project. Next, you just need the R markdown code. These are the three steps to run the the call. And now I'm uh, sharing what are the processing steps that are included. The call is uh, written using my, mainly the libraries uh, Tidyverse, SF, ccplot2, and R Markdown. And it, in, it includes uh, file and geometric operations, such as reading the zip files that were uh, saved in a given folder, and zipping the data, reading the hotspot point, uh, point shape files, and creating a spatial objects, look for a string patterns in the name files, to create the, the hotspot of objects. So this avoids uh, the, the source of error of manual selection of the, of the pond layers. Then all the geometric operations, the same that, that were included in the Cushy's um, modeler uh, that include merging the, the, the objects, reprojection, clipping to, clip to the studio area. Next, you can uh, obtain an interactive map of the hotspots of the current year and export the, the final layers to uh, shell packages. Also, other steps include uh, data cleaning, data tining, and producing the plots and the report. So this is uh, general um, data cleaning and data tidying uh, processes on the attribute tables of the layers. And then uh, you also obtain plots in English and, and in Spanish uh, with uh, showing daily hotspots, cumulative hotspots, and uh, also the um, image, uh, you can export the image of the plots. And I'm showing next uh, some of these plots and the annual comparisons and historical activity comparisons you can uh, obtain. This is an example of a, a report uh, in Spanish. The processing steps for both the geometric operations and the data tidying and the uh, and to obtain the reports are, is less than two minutes in my laptop. So to illustrate the workflow, I'm showing some results of uh, the, uh, the, the situation last year in the Paraná River Delta. This is a screenshot of the thermal hotspot from Beers data uh, in the Parana River Delta. You can, in the, in the interactive map, you can click any of these points and obtain information on them. And uh, next, uh, you obtain a plot summarizing the number of uh, Beers hotspots, uh, of daily Beers hotspots per day. And uh, here I used to, to monitor what was happening last year. I used Beers Hotspot because they have um, a medium resolution. The pixel has uh, 375 meters and uh, is um, better than MODIS. So here you can see that uh, the months with the highest number of hotspots was August which accounted uh, for almost 
40% of the total hotspot of the year. Next, you uh, can also obtain a, a plot showing the cumulative number of hotspots uh, all over the year and uh, the number of beer hotspots that is recorded in the year. The total number was almost 40,000. And also, you uh, can compare the historical uh, fire activity uh, for the uh, your study area. And uh, here, for example, using BIRS data uh, that has uh, this uh, resolution of 375 meters uh, of, of the pixel, um, here you can see that the total number of hotspots uh, was the highest in the last nine years. BIRS data are available since 2012. So if we want um, to compare, the, to, ana to analyze the historical, uh, the historical fire activity uh, from previous year, we need to use MODIS data. MODIS data are available since November 2001, and the resolution is of one kilometer. So uh, an, um, the number of MODIS hotspots during last year was uh, almost 9,000, 9,000, and were the highest since 2009. This is a plot that shows the number of MODIS uh, hotspots uh, recorded uh, per year, and you can see that there was a high number of hotspots, uh, of MODIS hotspots last year, but in 2008, that was also very dry um, a, a very dry year for and and the Paraná River floodplain was uh, was dry. Uh, in 2008, the number of hot spots was uh, larger. Um, lastly, I want to include an update on the fire activity during this year because you may know that the the Paraná River remains with very low hydrometric levels and uh, fire activity continues. So I updated the, the date, the analysis uh, yesterday and uh, I uh, obtained it that uh, this year all, uh, more than uh, 11,000 hotspots of beer hotspots were recorded and this is a lot but is uh, much less than uh, the the fire activity that was observed uh, in 2020. This plot shows the uh, monthly number of uh, hotspots, of beer hotspots uh, in 2020 and this year. So uh, our future work uh, will include an analysis of the relation between the historical fire activity and the agroclimatic trends. And I'm also working on estimation of, bar of the burned areas because more than fire hotspots bar is burned areas which, um, which is important for, uh, for uh, to analyze the ecological impact of the fires. So here you can see, for example, um, grasslands, an area of grasslands that was burned in the in in the Paraná River floodplain, and um, an idea was is to to use the thermal hotspots at seeds and uh, grow regions on uh, starting from these hotspots. I'm using uh, the R Saga library for uh, growing these regions, and uh, each region starts in an, area, in an area with a hotspot and grows according to the spectral similarity. Uh, I'm, I'm working now with uh, an index uh, called normalized burn ratio that is uh, computed from Sentinel-2 imagery. Thanks for your attention. Muchas gracias. Here are my contact details. Here is the um, link to the full article uh, in the Phosphor Sheet Proceedings um, um, journal. 
uh, here is also the GitHub repo of this project. And uh, I also want to share that most of the uh, pictures that I featured in my slides belong to a photographic essay project by Sebastián López Brach, that is founded by Nat Shio. I'm grateful to Sebastián, and also I want to share uh, his Instagram account for you to uh, to see more of his uh, work. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Natalia, for this uh, exciting uh, talk uh, and for, uh, a, 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 most of all, a, a, an excellent uh, research. Um, uh, I just want to make just one short note just before opening the floor for questions, and it is about the, a, a, work, a word that, that uh, is in the title of your talk that is reproducible. This is really a key word, and thanks for making your research reproducible. This is a very... Uh, it should become a standard practice. Uh, unfortunately, this is not always the case. So thanks for that. The link to the repository is in the slides. Uh, if you need the link now, I think we can paste it in the chat now, or you can uh, 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 even more easily just uh, open or find uh, Natalia's paper that is uh, associated to this talk and that is published in the Phosphor-G proceedings on the ISPRS uh, archives. So if you look for ISPRS archives uh, for Phosphor-G 2020, uh, lots of additional uh, details. Uh, Thanks also for the pictures and the link to the Instagram account. Of course, we do, don't like so much to see uh, fires, but we like to see pictures. So let's uh, clearly hope that the situation will uh, will improve. Uh, there is one question that was actually also some uh, question that I wanted to ask. Uh, that is about the uh, the uh, how this uh, research, how the, this data or the outcome of it, especially uh, or also regarding the historical analysis, will be used by any governmental institution or anyone else, any civil protection organizations, uh, fire brigades, or uh, anyone. Because that, that's very important, and I hope that this will be the case. Thanks for the question. Uh, our environmental uh, ministry, Ministerio Nacional de Ambiente, uh, is uh, using uh, fire records uh, from firms NASA. Uh, not my uh, analysis, but they are um, conducting their own uh, processing and analysis. So my results uh, were used mainly. Uh, I used them mainly to disseminate what was happening and uh, to analyze uh, which uh, areas we are being burned um, to uh, detect uh, uh, probably to maybe to disseminate what was happening in social media and uh, also uh, we work with some non-governmental uh, non-governmental organizations uh, that were um, reporting uh, intentional fires or uh, fires accidental fire follow what follow what by uh, land use changes so uh, that was my the use of my my analysis thanks a lot this definitely answers the question we have other questions from the audience um do you correct for errors in active fire products no so for the moment i didn't correct for for errors in in the active fire products i had um um ground truth data related both to um conversations with local uh, with local settlers and uh, with uh, journalists and have also some um, um, here referenced points uh, obtained with the with flights uh, but uh, so that I use that ground data to check if the active fi if the active fire were really fires or not uh, but I didn't correct uh, the, the data. Uh, my, my aim was to conduct quick analysis during the, um, the, um, the situation. Thanks for the question. Uh, uh, questions keep appearing uh, in, uh, uh, in Venueless. So the next one, did you compare the active file records of the two sources that you use, Modis and Veers, and do they show any difference? 
the main difference that that uh, show uh, was that beers, uh, since it has a, a better spatial resolution, detected a smaller uh, fire areas, and um, if uh, if you if you use beers data to um, to detect to to then detect burned areas, you may um, you may uh, detect the the burning area better because because of the course of, because of the better resolution. So uh, this data uh, showed more hot spots and uh, small fires uh, were easily detected than with MODIS. Thanks, Natalia. We can quickly go through the last uh, question. Um, can you use the results for projects to reforest or restore burned areas? Uh, it's a good question. I think that the the fact is that uh, the the problem in the area is that some of the areas that were burned were um, changed the the land use. For example, they uh, were converted from natural areas or areas with cattle to agricultural areas. So that is the same the the, the general problem. I don't know if. Uh, Reforest, uh, reforesting uh, is the main um, issue here in the area, but uh, probably you can use the data to locate which areas are being more seriously affected and to take actions in, in the ground. Thanks a lot, Natalia, uh, for answering the questions and uh, uh, for once again giving a very interesting presentation. Uh, we need to close uh, here. Uh, I would like also to thank the audience for the uh, good questions and the input. And I hope uh, and I'm sure also you like the talk. If this is the case, please let us know and let Natalia know using the applause button in Vendulus. Thanks a lot and I wish you all a good uh, continuation of Postgre 2021. Bye. Thank you, Mark. Bye bye.